I was asked to, to speak about uh, microbiota gut-brain axis and possible treatments, whether it's probiotics or, or uh, fecal microbiota transplantation. So during my talk, I will be kind of mixing the, uh, the data from animal studies and from, uh, from patients. And I think that it, uh, it gives a, a bit better perspective, actually, of what we know, what, what is really confirmed in, in humans. And, and to more to show what we still don't know, because I think there is, uh, we are still just scraping, uh, I mean, uh, scratching the surface of, of all this microbiome uh, field and the, the importance for health and disease. So first we should realize that uh, we are not alone on the earth and uh, we, uh, even before us, I mean, the, the, there were many uh, organisms and probably the bacteria were most uh, numerous. And when you do the gross estimates, uh, um, uh, it was stated that there is around 10 to 30 bacterial cells uh, on our planet. So if we compare it to, uh, to humans, it's, um, we are 10 to 10. So we, are, we have each of us has approximately 10 to 10 to 13 cells each. But apart from uh, having our own uh, human cells, we are carrying uh, a significant amount of microbiota, and it could be between half a kilogram to two kilograms of bacteria, in, which equals around 10 to 13 uh, uh, gut bacteria per uh, uh, human, per individual. You can find bacteria actually everywhere, and they are at different densities uh, in our planet, so it can go from uh, even from the atmosphere, where you can find uh, free-floating bacteria, aquatic. And actually, the highest concentration is in the mammalian intestine. So definitely, there must be some reason why the bacteria seek shelter. And, with a, and then uh, if it's very likely that they influence some effects on, on the host. So probably, you have already heard about microbiome I mean, uh, when you uh, when you look at the, the newspaper, when you look at the internet, microbiome is actually everywhere. And when you just do a simple search in PubMed, and, and this is what I did actually this morning, so combining the keywords of microbiome, of microbiota, you can see the, the sudden explosion of uh, papers, whether they are originals or original or uh, uh, reviews on that topic. So, before 2000, there were probably around uh, 15 to 20 articles published every year. This year already, it's around uh, 8,400, and uh, just by simple estimation, it will be probably above 11,000 articles uh, published just in 2018. So there's a definitely a, a, a microbiome hype. So we have already, I mean, in gastroenterology, we started with this uh, a few years ago, but now it's catching also in, in other fields. And, and it's very similar to what we also experienced uh, in previous decades, whether it was with the discovery of human genome or in, uh, in the gastroenterology field, it was uh, discovery of uh, H. pylori. And when you just uh, look at this uh, a simple graphic, which I acquired actually from Wikipedia, there is always some technological trigger which starts all this. Then there is this peak of inflated expectations, and I think we are just before reaching actually that peak. And after that, uh, there is usually some uh, uh, period of disillusion. Uh, then there is a, well, as it described, slope of enlightenment, and and then we start actually getting the reasonable information, or we start using the information we acquired from that field uh, in a practical way. So what was actually the uh, uh, the technological discovery which uh, enabled this, and it was actually the molecule profiling. So um, uh, during the previous decades, we were mainly relying on cultures, and cultures can be quite unreliable because using the standard techniques, we can culture probably less than 50% of a microbiome, and especially if we speak about a human microbiome. However, it, it changed, and I will speak about it later. However. Uh, during the last 20 years, uh, well, what happened was uh, the, the use of uh, uh, microbial profiling using uh, DNA or RNA. And 
Probably 10 years ago when we started uh, doing the, the research in this area, just analysis of one sample using uh, the, the deep sequencing uh, cost several thousand dollars. Now the price is around $30. So we have really advanced uh, dramatically with, research, with uh, respect to the technological advancement. And using the rather complicated uh, pipelines of bioinformatics, we can determine what is the composition of uh, bacteria in the bowel. And I would like to use actually this um, this nice example, if you look at the, um, in the upper left, you will see the jar with uh, different candies. And actually, they, uh, they are of different colors, and they represent different uh, uh, microbial populations. So what the sequencing is doing is actually putting the uh, different uh, microbial uh, populations together and, uh, and actually arranging them. And like that, we can comment on uh, representation of individual um, uh, bacterial strains and uh, their uh, frequency in that specific community. During the last few years, we realized that actually doing just simple sequencing or straight sequencing uh, doesn't uh, catch all the, the bacteria which we, um, which we can find in the bowel. So um, if you have time or you are interested, I would uh, refer you to recent work from uh, Mike Surat's lab, where actually they used combination of uh, uh, culturing and sequencing. And with this uh, combined method, you can actually uh, recover 30% more bacteria from, uh, uh, from human intestine, and especially um, the one which are in low abundance. Furthermore, you can isolate the bacteria and, and test them further, because while the bio, bioinformatics can tell you what are the uh, presumed function of these bacteria, you should be still testing it in vitro or in animal models. So, um, there is an extra benefit if you are able actually to isolate and culture uh, selected bacteria. And again, what uh, Mike Surat's uh, uh, group has shown that you can culture over 90% of, of bacteria, but you have just to, uh, to dedicate a bit more time and resources to this. So what is the role of microbiota in human health and disease? And I will uh, try to uh, make kind of overview of what is known uh, up to now. So intestinal microbiota has a crucial role in the development of the host innate and adaptive immune responses. And it, this has been already known uh, uh, during the last four or five decades. There were seminal, several seminal works from, uh, from 50s. And uh, during the last uh, 10, 15 years, it was confirmed by uh, newer techniques. And this is a simple picture which uh, shows uh, uh, how immune system looks in germ-free and colonized mice. And on the left side, you can see uh, the tissues from the intestine of uh, germ-free mice. So that means mice which are raised without any microbiota. And on the right, uh, these are samples from mice uh, uh, which are conventionally raised. So that means with normal microbiota. And you can see the density of um, uh, IgA, so immunoglobulins, um, IgA Peyer's patches or uh, CD4 uh, lymphocyte is dramatically increased in mice uh, uh, that have a regular microbiota. Gut bacteria serve also the host by protecting against infections. They can help us to extract uh, nutrients from, from the diet. They help to help, uh, metabolize drugs, and I will speak about it later. And they also influence the absorption and distribution of body fat. And again, these are uh, the very first studies which actually uh, pointed out to this uh, role of microbiota, already published more than 12 years ago. And here you can see actually microbiota profiles in um, individuals, I mean in humans, who were either obese or lean. And when you compare the microbiota profile, and especially looking at these two big groups of bacteria, Firmicutes and Bacteroides, Bacteroides you can find that uh, there are big differences in proportion of these two major groups. And again, if you start the patients who are overweight or obese on a weight loss uh, diet, these proportions are changing. Furthermore, if you um, use animal models, and this, is, uh, uh, this was another st study published at the same year, 
Um, these are two animals, uh, or animal model of uh, obesity of, of mice and uh, compared to lean mice. So if you just take the microbiota from these mice and you colonize germ-free recipients, these mice in adulthood develop the same phenotype as the uh, you can find in the donors. So the microbiota can definitely uh, contribute to, to overweight or obesity. Probably it's not as simple as uh, the original study suggested, but there is uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, some basis for this. And I would jump actually um, uh, more than a decade later. And this was a study which was uh, uh, recently, I mean, uh, three years ago, published in Cell. And it's a study from, uh, from patients, uh, patients who were rather uh, overweight or, or normal weight, but they were actually, uh, some of them, they had problems with their um, uh, glycemia, that means uh, blood sugars. And this was a study of uh, 800 patients, and the authors uh, studied uh, responses to standard diets, and what they found that each person responded slightly differently uh, to a standard diet. Uh, there were different uh, 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 peaks uh, or, or uh, uh, curves of the, um, uh, of the glycemia post meals. And it really differed uh, from one patient uh, to another. Uh, part of the study was also to analyze uh, uh, gut microbiota. And there was actually, this was a huge amount of data, so uh, uh, what the authors used was actually the computational uh, analysis, so basically providing all the data, uh, the, the genetic background, uh, uh, the questionnaires for that means uh, dietary habits, but also physical characteristics of, uh, of these individuals. And using machine learning uh, procedures, they were able to, to identify uh, certain predictors. So I already said that there was higher variability in the response to identical meals. However, these uh, new machine learning algorithms they, uh, that integrated all these parameters are mentioned, including gut microbiota, led to accurate predictions of personalized postprandial glycemic responses to real life meals. What it tells us that really microbiota contributes to the metabolic activity of the host, the way how we digest and process uh, the meals. I have already mentioned that uh, gut microbiota uh, helps to um, process or, or metabolize a different medication. This is a study from 2014, and at the time the authors described 40 different uh, medications which, uh, which were uh, directly or indirectly affected uh, by microbiota. And there are different ways how uh, the gut bacteria can do it. They can uh, just activate the drug for us as gastroenterologists. Uh, sulfasalazine, uh, 5-SA, this is one of the main drugs, uh, main drug we use uh, for treatment of patients with chronic inflammation like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And it's actually delivered in inactive form in a prodrug. And it's the gut bacteria which actually metabolize it and release the active moiety. It can also, the gut microbiota can uh, detoxify or inactivate drug and again, there is a specific bacterium, which is called uh, Egertella, which can neutralize or disactivate uh, digoxin, which is one of the cardiac glycosides used in patients with uh, cardiac issues. There can be also direct binding, and it has been described for, so for, uh, for example, for levodopa. So one of the, uh, pac uh, one of the treatment uh, for Parkinson's disease and um, again, there is a, uh, the bacterium which can um, directly bind to, to the drug and actually either increase or decrease its, uh, its efficacy. So let's now speak about uh, gut, about gastrointestinal tract because this is something which is uh, close to me. So we have to realize uh, that uh, the gut is exposed every day to myriads of uh, bacterial antigens and bacterial metabolites. And this is coming from commensal bacteria, uh, possible or potential pathogens, and also there is a role of dietary antigens. The gut function 
actually depends on multiple uh, parameters. So we have the epithelium, basically it's uh, one layer of uh, cells which separate uh, the, uh, the gut lumen uh, 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 from the human tissue. We have uh, a smooth muscle, we have immune system, which is actually um, uh, highly developed in the gut, and we have uh, the neural system, which can uh, work quite autonomously from, from the brain. And again, all these factors, they have to work in concert in order to have normal or healthy uh, bowel function. And we are learning more and more that gut bacteria are actually a critical determinant uh, of this healthy gut function. So what determines the microbiota profiles or, or function? So definitely there are genetic uh, factors. We, I mean, most of us, we inherit uh, uh, gut microbiota profiles from our mothers. But uh, multiple studies show that one of the main determinants is actually a long-term diet. So there was, a, again, a study already several years ago uh, which uh, showed that uh, if you take a group of healthy volunteers and you uh, feed them different diets, whether they will be high in protein or, or high in fiber, you will find small shifts in their microbiota profile. And the, the picture here shows actually this, what is called principal component analysis, which we used in microbiome research. And basically, uh, this graph contains all the information, so from type of bacteria, their numbers, their proportion, and all is squeezed actually into a very, very simple graph. And each uh, group of dots of same color represent uh, microbiota profiles from one volunteer. And you can see that there are some changes, that they, but they, all of them, they cluster together. So what is important uh, that they, each diet is able to change in the short term uh, the microbiota profile, but it seems that it's more the, uh, the long-term diet which is uh, determining uh, the microbiota profiles. And again, there are several um, theories, one of them that there are two, some of them that say that there are three enterotypes, so many basic uh, microbiota profiles. In this study from, uh, from Wu, in, uh, published in Science 2011, they found these two main microbiota profiles, and they actually they correlated uh, with a long-term diet. So people who um, uh, were mainly, uh, their diet was mainly vegetarian-based, uh, uh, they had higher uh, concentrations of prevotella, while uh, uh, the individuals who were mainly kind of meat or mixed uh, diet dependent had higher proportion of uh, bacteroides. And we can see it actually that uh, the microbiota profiles change dramatically if you suddenly uh, decide to, to change your diet. If you one day you decide to go gluten free or if you decide to go be vegetarian, your microbiota profiles probably within weeks will undergo significant change. So the intestinal microbiota is quite stable, at least uh, in health, um, probably after the age of three or four year, uh, uh, age of uh, four, your microbiota is stable, but there are uh, many factors which can uh, affect its composition. So it can be uh, antibiotics, it can be stress, it can be uh, um, infections or uh, uh, diseases. So. Can this actually uh, affect the, the health? And again, this comes with, a, or I would like to present this uh, concept of dysbiosis, which is uh, um, defined uh, altered stable microbiota that can cause harm to the host. So again, using these uh, uh, simple jars, I mean, on the left you can see the normal microbiota, multiple colors present. If such a microbiota uh, uh, consortium is, uh, subjected to infection, treatment with antibiotics, or stress, whether it's acute stress or repetitive stress, you will change the microbiota profile. You may even change the, the, the microbiota numbers. And in most cases, the microbiota can return to its original state. But in some individuals, in some patients, uh, this altered state persists, and they will develop dysbiosis. And there is... Uh, 
accumulating data to suggest that uh, this dysbiosis is also uh, associated with, uh, uh, with different diseases. This is a very complex, uh, very complex picture, and I, but um, I want to show it because I think it's one of the landmark study which uh, showed uh, quite clearly that the gut microbiota composition can correlate with the diet and also with health and disease. And this is actually a study from Ireland uh, where the author studied several hundred uh, elderly uh, individuals and they were either living at home, they were living in uh, uh, kind of short-term um, uh, facilities or they were hospitalized and they, they uh, lived for a prolonged period in hospitals. And when you study their diet and also their microbiota, you can see that actually uh, those who were living at home and uh, uh, had a rich uh, diet, they had also diverse or rich microbiota and in a way this was associated with uh, good health. Not surprisingly, the patients who were on the other side of the spectrum, they were uh, hospitalized and probably uh, had also uh, different treatment, uh, multiple uh, courses of antibiotics, had reduced microbial diversity, and also this was associated with uh, different uh, uh, um, factors or different uh, uh, items which uh, suggested um, uh, that their health was affected, whether it was increased in inflammatory markers, changes in their mental status, increased levels of depression, or, or, or overall their uh, func uh, decrease in their functional independence. So I have now uh, mentioned on, I mean, few occasions the, the, the mental status of depression. So. Um, this, was also, this is also a topic of my talk, so the, the question is, can microbiome also affect distant organs? Can it affect actually the central nervous system and, and behavior? And I would like to show you a, a video. This is actually from our uh, experiments, which we did already quite a few years ago. And in the first one, you can see a, a conventional uh, bulb sea mouse. So this is a mouse which was raised with bacteria. And uh, what you are seeing is the step-down test. So uh, the mouse is placed on an elevated platform, and um, you just wait until the mouse steps down. So although it sounds relatively simple, the, the, there is a, a lot to be said about risk assessment and, and the, uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the ability to, to explore uh, the environment. So if you leave this uh, mouse there for uh, unlimited time, usually it takes them between uh, three to five minutes uh, to step down. Now, if you take the same strain of uh, mice and you derive them germ-free, you can see that their different is, is behavior, is, is different. And although it's, uh, it also explores the, the environment, it's more daring and uh, basically steps down within uh, 30 seconds. So this, was, this has been uh, studied uh, on multiple occasions and some of the first studies also came from, uh, from McMaster actually, from Jane Foster and um, uh, John Bienenstock's group. But I want to, to show you um, another study. This came actually from uh, Karolinska uh, University in Sweden where basically they compare the behavior but also brain chemistry between conventional and germ-free mice. And here what you can see are heat maps from different regions of the brain, whether it's frontal cortex or hippocampus. And um, you can see that the expression of multiple genes is actually uh, differentially altered between the conventional, it means uh, SPF mice, and germ-free mice. So overall, what we know, at least from the animal studies, is that the bacterial colonization alters mouse behavior, uh, also alters expression of multiple genes and uh, neurotrophins in, in the brain. We have some unpublished data showing that it's mainly the innate part of the immune system which contributes to this. 
The germ-free mice have also altered structure in the brain, so the, the blood-brain barrier seems to be different. There are changes in morphology of the amygdala and hippocampus. These are uh, two of the important areas of the brain which affect uh, behavior. And they have altered profiles of myelination and uh, plasticity and uh, defects in microglia, which are um, um, immune cells which are localized in the brain. So we have clearly established that the bacterial colonization changes many aspects of behavior and brain chemistry. So what about if you just take normal healthy mice and change their microbiome? And this is, uh, again, a study which we did already quite a few years ago. And we use the same mice which I showed you in the, the movie before, the bulb C mice. And what we did is we treated them for one week with uh, non-absorbable uh, antibiotics. And here, this is a, in this pie, you can see that the antibiotic or antimicrobial treatment expanded uh, the proportion of firmicutes in these uh, mice. So we also, we again used the uh, step-down test. And uh, again, in, in these experiments, um, it was around 220, 230 seconds which took these mice to step down. However, when they were treated with uh, antimicrobials, they were stepping down within uh, 30 to uh, 50 seconds. Interestingly, this was also accompanied by changes in uh, several brain areas, and this is, uh, I'm showing data from the amygdala and hippocampus, and what we did is to measure one of the important neurotrophins, uh, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and this is an important factor because it's uh, one of the key elements in uh, determining uh, uh, neuronal plasticity. So, you see the different effects uh, of in the amygdala and hippocampus, and this is actually very consistent also with the role of these areas on, on this kind of behavior. We then did other experiments, and here we explored actually the two different uh, strains of mice and their uh, different behavior profiles. So I already spoke about these bulb sea mice, which are kind of shy. They are very hesitant with respect to the uh, exploratory behavior. But we have also NIH Swiss mice. These are outbred mice. They are very active, they're very daring. So when you look at this, uh, uh, again, step-down test, uh, uh, they are opposite to, to bulb sea mice. So, in, we asked the question, can we just transfer the microbiota from mouse strain to another, and could this also change the behavior profile of these mice? So first what we did is to raise the, uh, I mean, uh, derive mice germ-free, and then we colonize them with their own microbiota. And basically we reproduced uh, uh, the previous behavior studies. However, when you took the NIH Swiss mice and you colonized them with bulb C microbiota, suddenly they started to be more hesitant. They were stepping down with a longer delay. And on the contrary, the bulb C mice, uh, which were colonized with uh, NIH Swiss microbiota, now became more daring. And although it didn't completely reverse uh, their behavior profiles, there were significant shifts which would suggest that really microbiota uh, has a, a role in uh, um, normal mouse behavior. So what are the possible mechanisms which can, uh, which can uh, um, be responsible for this uh, microbial effect on the brain? So first, uh, gut microbiota can induce secretion of uh, different pro-inflammatory mediators, uh, whether these are cytokines, chemokines, and we know that uh, these molecules can have direct effect on the central nervous system and behavior. Another possible mechanism is uh, change in serotonin, 5-HT. So over 90% of serotonin is actually produced in the gut by enteroendocrine cells, and there is uh, already some uh, published data and new data which will be published uh, soon showing that specific bacteria can actually upregulate uh, the production of uh, serotonin in the gut. There are other neuroactive uh, molecules uh, um, like fatty acids, for example, a short chain fatty acids, especially butyrate, which is uh, produced solely uh, by bacteria and again can uh, directly affect uh, the neural system.
And we have to keep in mind uh, that bacteria can actually produce the same neurotransmitters uh, as we do. So there are actually theories that uh, we have just uh, borrowed the, the metabolic pathways we, we have uh, from bacteria. So there were multiple studies showing that uh, bacteria, when uh, in the right environment and given uh, 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 good uh, uh, um, I mean, a good uh, culture environment can produce, uh, for example, GABA, they can produce serotonin, but there are also uh, um, other um, uh, typical neurotransmitters which can be, uh, which can be produced. Furthermore, um, bacteria can also produce what is called trace amines, and these are simple or precursors of um, neurotransmitters which are used in uh, norvertebrates. Uh, uh, for example, uh, octopamine. Another possibility by which gut microbiome can signal to the brain is the direct neural pathways. And it has been shown in several studies uh, that uh, uh, gut bacteria can signal through the vagus nerve, possible also through the spinal nerves. And like that, the, the brain can actually detect changes in uh, bacterial composition within hours, I mean, before any significant changes in the immune systems are detected. And this communication is actually bidirectional. So again, um, there are studies in um, animal models and humans showing that, for example, uh, during stress, uh, uh, the composition and function of gut microbiota can be changed, and it seems that it's uh, uh, mediated by uh, uh, adrenergic nerve and secretion of uh, noradrenaline. So we have kind of set up the, the stage, I mean, what, uh, what can be uh, done or, or caused by the bacteria. So let's speak about uh, um, gut microbiota as possible cause of functional gastrointestinal diseases. And this is important for me because uh, most of the patients I see uh, will be those with uh, irritable bowel syndrome or functional dyspepsia. And it has been recognized uh, that uh, these disorders are actually stemming from uh, problems between uh, gut-brain uh, communication or interaction. So, Irritable bowel syndrome is very common. It affects between 10 and 15 percent of the uh, world's population. Um, there are probably multiple factors which, uh, which contribute to its uh, genesis. And animal models and clinical studies show that uh, uh, low-grade inflammation may be one of these. There are probably also changes in intestinal permeability. Many patients also complained of uh, abdominal pain, so uh, changes in visceral hypersensitivity were also demonstrated. And uh, when you think about uh, what is kind of uh, uh, unifying factor is uh, it's gut microbiota. I was speaking about it earlier that actually gut uh, bacteria can affect multiple systems in the, in the gut and causing changes in the neuromuscular function. It has been also recognized that uh, the, uh, for IBS and other functional disorders, there are some central factor, whether it's stress, anxiety, depression, or abnormal processing of um, stimuli which are actually coming from the brain. So what do we know about irritable bowel syndrome and uh, bacteria? So first, there, there are many studies, I'll just list it, uh, three of them here, that infection, bacterial infection, can trigger uh, IBS. And depending on uh, what clinical studies, it can be between uh, 10 to 20% of patients who suffer acute uh, infectious gastroenteritis will uh, develop these uh, chronic problems, which is abdominal pain and change in bowel habits, whether it's diarrhea or constipation. Now we also know uh, that antibiotics for non-gastrointestinal causes can trigger abdominal symptoms, or on the contrary, now we use antibiotics uh, to treat irritable bowel syndrome. And again, there will be a proportion of patients which uh, respond to this treatment. 
And finally, when you look at the microbiota uh, profiles of patients with irritable bowel syndrome, you find that some of them will have uh, different microbial composition when you compare it to healthy control. And this is, again, a study which was published several years ago, but I think it illustrates it very well. So again, uh, what was done, this was a uh, combined study between a um, group in Ireland and Sweden, um, that they study microbiota profiles in patients with irritable, uh, irritable bowel syndrome and controls. And when you put together the profiles, you will see that there is a clustering. So there is a group of patients which will, that will have uh, different microbial profiles uh, from uh, healthy controls. But again, there will be proportion of patients in whom you cannot uh, recognize any changes in microbiota when you compare them to, uh, to healthy individuals. So maybe it's not the microbiota profile, but maybe it's what the microbiota is doing. And again, there are several studies showing that the metabolic activity of, of gut microbiota is altered in patients with, uh, with IBS. And in that case, we should be looking more at the uh, metabolomic activity, I mean, short-chain fatty acids and uh, maybe uh, pro-inflammatory mediators. So, as I say, because this is, uh, um, this is topic which is uh, studied in our lab, we, we did uh, study in, uh, um, in microbiota and IBS, and we asked a very simple question, is there a causal role? So, what happens if you transfer the microbiota from patients with IBS into germ-free mice. And the design was very simple, so we recruited five healthy controls. We recruited also eight patients with IBS with uh, diarrhea. We collected their stool samples, and each stool sample was used to colonize 10, 10 germ-free mice. We, uh, we let them uh, rest for three weeks, and after that period, when we think that the uh, gut colonization is kind of stable, we assessed gut function, uh, also their behavior, and we collected the tissue samples. So unfortunately, this, uh, there was a problem with the uh, uh, transfer from MAC to PC, but uh, this uh, graph, uh, which is rather complicated, uh, uh, shows uh, several things. So first, this is a pr basically principal component analysis, what I was already telling you about, where one dot actually represents either one uh, patient or one healthy individual and um, one mouse. So here on the left side, the, the circles, these are microbiota profiles from either healthy individuals, which are in blue, or in red, which are from patients. And you see that there is a not really clear separation between these two. But what is most uh, more in interesting is that when you take one uh, patient and transfer the stool sample into 10 germ-free mice, you can see that all these uh, mice uh, cluster together. So that means you can transfer some microbiota specific profile from human to, to mouse. However, there is this shift, and we shouldn't be surprised about it because I was already telling you earlier that microbiota profiles are also determined by the diet, so uh, mouse chow is definitely different from, from human, uh, at least North American diet. So you, you can see definitely this shift. It's also determined by different uh, physiology in the mouse intestine. You can see the same clustering and shift also when you examine the microbiota profiles uh, transferred from uh, patients to, to mice. Again, all these 10 mice which receive the same sample cluster together, but uh, uh, they are, in most cases, they are uh, separate from the, the human donor. So what we did first is to study uh, gastrointestinal motility. I, I told you that these were all patients with uh, diarrhea, chronic diarrhea. So we used a modification of a, a technique which is used in patients, which is a shape study, and we gavaged uh, five small metallic beads to, to the mice, and we also gavaged them with diluted barium. Three hours later, we took the pictures, and 
If you can see these uh, uh, black dots on, on the left, this is in uh, uh, healthy microbiota colonized mice, you can see that actually there are four uh, metallic beads in the cecum of the mouse and one is uh, in the distal small intestine. When you look at a mouse which uh, was colonized with IBSD microbiota, you can find only one uh, metallic bead. All the others were already expelled. So when you uh, make a combined score for this, you can actually uh, quantify the intestinal transit, and especially when putting together the data from all healthy microbiota colonized mice and IBS uh, microbiota colonized mice, you can see a clear difference in the microbiota profile. So, which tells you that the functional aspects, which we hope that we will be able to, to see in this mice, can be really transferred from human donors to, to mice. We have also noticed that there were changes in intestinal permeability, and it was both in the, in the colon and in the small intestine, in, although in the intestine uh, it did not reach uh, uh, high statistical significance. Now, uh, I would like to speak about uh, transference of behavior because uh, when we recruited the patients, four out of eight patients had uh, uh, normal behavior or, or they felt normal, while four of them displayed uh, moderate anxiety. And when you now cluster the, the mice which, uh, that were colonized with microbiota with or without uh, uh, anxiety or comorbid anxiety, you can see also uh, changes in, in behavior of these recipient mice. Interestingly, this was actually this correlated with uh, uh, um, marker of immune activation in the, in the gut. So this is beta defensin, specifically beta defensin 3. It's a part of the innate uh, uh, immune system. And um, these are molecules which are actually being uh, secreted into, into the lumen in response to infection or changes in uh, microbial profiles. And you can see that the mice uh, that were colonized uh, with microbiota from patients with comorbid anxiety actually had increased levels of this uh, uh, beta defensin, suggesting that maybe immune uh, activation is uh, one of the underlying mechanisms. So in that specific paper, we, we were interested whether there are other genes which would be responsible for that, and uh, this was a uh, we used nanostring uh, technology where you have a kit of 250 genes. And from these, there were multiple genes which were either increased or decreased in uh, patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And among them, there were either uh, chemokines, cytokines, the receptors. And interestingly, uh, this C3, which is uh, a part of the complement system, uh, why uh, it is important is that uh, C3 is actually has been linked to uh, release of histamine, and again, histamine is one of the mediators which can lead to uh, visceral hypersensitivity and uh, pain generation. We also uh, studied whether these are just uh, isolated genes or whether there is any, uh, any pattern in this, and for that we use this uh, complex software, Ingenuity Pathway Analysis, and we found that there were many uh, networks which were related mainly to the immune system, but they also affected uh, the neural system. And uh, it seems that the, the, the microbiota from patients with IBS uh, was able to induce changes in uh, uh, morphology of neurons, guidance of axons, or differentiation of uh, neuroglia. So there were many possible mechanisms by which actually the, the gut microbiota from these patients can change uh, behavior. I have already mentioned that maybe it's not important who is there, but what these bacteria are doing. So we have also, in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Brits McKibben from the chemistry department, uh, analyzed uh, serum uh, metabolomic profiles of these mice. And we found that there was a separation between, the, between these groups. And um, on the left, you see actually unsupervised analysis. On the, on the right, there is uh, supervised analysis. So again, the, the serum profiles uh, always clustered according to the 
uh, to the human donor. And there were at least two major uh, metabolites. One of them was uh, lisaphosphatidylcholine, the other one O-acetyl-L-carnitine. And both of these uh, metabolites have been used to uh, to changes either in, uh, in behavior, uh, depressive behavior, or in regulation of brain energy or uh, neurotransmitters. So again, one of the possible pathways through which the gut microbiota really uh, can change uh, the behavior. So this was, uh, um, this, so this study showed that uh, Microbiota from patients with IBS can change the gut function and in some cases can also uh, change behavior of these mice. But in, in a way it opens another field and, and this is the primary psychiatric disorder. So can actually microbiota be a cause of uh, uh, either anxiety or depression or at least in a subset of patient? So what do we know? What are, what are the clinical data? So, what is the most compelling are the, uh, are the studies or the, the I would say, uh, daily practice in, in gastroenterology from patients with hepatic encephalopathy. So if you have a patient who, have, who has end-stage liver disease, um, they develop changes in, uh, in their cognition, which is called encephalopathy. And this is because the liver serves as a filter or, or, or a detoxification organ for, for many metabolites. And the changes in the mental status can change from very mild, which would be, uh, for example, change in uh, uh, sleep pattern or attention, to, to coma, where the patient is really not uh, reacting even to, to strong stimuli. And the treatment which you can offer to these patients is either laxatives or antibiotics. And within a few hours, the patient basically wakes up from coma. So it's very, very impressive. There were studies which showed that actually the microbiota profiles are different between the, the patients with cirrhosis, I mean uh, liver disease, with and without encephalopathy. When we look at the patients with uh, really psychiatric disorders, and this is uh, major depression, there are uh, studies already um, 20 years ago which showed that uh, intestinal fermentation profiles are different in, in these patients. And uh, recent studies uh, uh, show that uh, patients with uh, depression have actually different microbiota profiles. Furthermore, these two studies also show that if you uh, uh, take some uh, microbial samples from these patients and transfer it into germ-free mice or rats, you can induce some uh, signs of uh, altered behavior or depression uh, in these recipient mice. And again, which is uh, highly uh, uh, publicized, is uh, the role of microbiota in autism. And again, there are multiple studies which were uh, published on this topic. What they show that there is abnormal microbiota in patients with uh, autism, um, whether it is cause or consequence is unclear because these patients have also very uh, uh, different uh, um, diets or, or eating habits. But uh, what was interesting that there were, uh, uh, there were some studies which show that uh, in some patients, especially in those with late onset, you can improve the symptoms if you treat them with uh, antibiotics. So there may be, again, uh, at least in a subset of these patients, microbiota may play an important role. Our group is also interested in the role of uh, microbiota in, in uh, psychiatric disorders, especially in, in anxiety. And, and the reason is because it's one of the most prevalent psychiatric conditions. It affects up to uh, 30 people, 30% 30 of people in their lifetime. The economic burden is, is huge and it's actually growing. And the pathophysiology of this disorder is actually uh, not understood. So, we asked actually a question, uh, question, could microbiota uh, be responsible for, for anxiety, at least in a subset of patients? And, and this was a study, uh, or it is a study which was done in collaboration with uh, Rebecca Anglin from the psychiatry department at McMaster. Uh, where we studied the, the microbiota profiles, but also beta defense in concentration in patients uh, with uh, generalized anxiety and healthy controls. 
And although the microbiota profiles were rather similar, there was a marked difference in beta defensin concentration in, in these patients. And I'm showing you the data from the first uh, part of, of the cohort. So the question in this study is always to select the, the good donor, I mean, to choose the, the ones where you have the highest chance of showing any differences. So what we did is actually we have uh, uh, picked up uh, uh, the stool sample with highest concentration of beta defensin. Uh, I will also explain uh, why. Uh, and a healthy control with relatively low levels of beta defensins. The reason for, for this patient is that uh, why we have uh, chosen her is that this, this was a young woman of 19 year olds, otherwise uh, healthy, no other comorbidity, and we have matched her with this healthy control, also 20 year old female. We use the same strategy as the previous study, and this is actually to colonize uh, germ-free mice uh, with uh, stool microbiota from these individuals, and we tested their behavior three weeks later. So first, I want to show this study on, on uh, beta defensins, and which shows that actually we were able to transfer the immune activation from human uh, to mice. So what about the behavior? So I will show you again just two videos, because I think that they, they illustrate really the, um, uh, my point. So um, this is a digging test where you put a mouse in a new cage and you observe it uh, for 10 minutes. So this is an accelerated movie. So this is a healthy microbiota uh, uh, colonized mouse, and you can see that she's just exploring the, uh, the cage. So kind of normal behavior. And now have a look how the behavior changes in, in a mouse which was colonized with uh, uh, microbiota from a patient with anxiety. So the, this mouse engages into excessive digging, uh, which is a, a one of the features of anxiety-like behavior. When looking now at the, the brain of, uh, of these mice, we, we assess the level of uh, brain-derived neurotrophic uh, factor in the hippocampus. And overall, the GAD colonized uh, mice showed lower levels of, uh, uh, of BDNF in microbiota, and the opposite trends were actually, again, observed in, in amygdala, which, is, uh, which goes well with this uh, behavior profile. So it seems that at least in some patients with primary psychiatric disorders, microbiota may be uh, the culprit, and the, the studies are actually uh, ongoing. So then uh, let's move back to the functional gastrointestinal disorders because we, were, uh, we established the microbiota can uh, change the gut function. So can we use microbial-based therapies uh, to treat these disorders and, or maybe the psychiatric diseases? So let's speak first about fecal microbiota transplantation. And again, this is a very hot topic, uh, uh, not only in gastroenterology. If you go on internet, you can find very detailed uh, instructions how to perform it at home. And it's actually done for uh, multiple uh, disorders, whether they are disorders of the gut or, or metabolic uh, syndrome or even uh, uh, psychiatric uh, disorders. So, there are certain conditions where fecal microbiota transplantation, that means taking uh, microbiota or stool sample from a healthy individual and, and uh, um, infusing basically that material into a patient is highly effective. And one of these uh, diseases is uh, recurrent uh, C. difficile infection. So Clostridium difficile is, uh, uh, can be very serious. Uh, very often it uh, is found or, or occurs in elderly patients or patients who had some uh, antibiotic treatment. And in a high or growing proportion, uh, this infection uh, is impossible to, to treat with antibiotics. And uh, fecal microbiota transplantation is actually very effective in these patients, and sometimes you need just one application of uh, FMT uh, to uh, treat and cure uh, this symptom. So uh, this is uh, just the overview. So if you look at the case series study, so that means uh, 
basically observational studies, the, uh, the effect is, uh, or the, the success is around 85%. Uh, there were only two uh, randomized controlled trials and the, the effect is uh, relatively lower, 75%, but if you compare it to any um, antibiotic treatment, this is uh, much uh, superior. It seems that uh, FMT may be also uh, useful in other chronic disorders of the GI tract, and there was a study or, um, done in, uh, here in McMaster in patients with ulcerative colitis, and again, it didn't work in everybody, but uh, the clinical remission, that means really resolution of, of symptoms of colitis, was found in 24% of patients who received FMT compared to 5% in the placebo arm. So it works with some, but definitely it's, it's much higher than placebo. And there are ongoing studies which actually look at the, whether it depends on the, the microbiota profile of the recipient and uh, of the donor. What is the ideal administration? Should we administer it on a weekly basis, every two weeks? Uh, uh, should we pretreat with antibiotics? So these are all questions which we need, but it definitely it's an uh, it's a area which deserves uh, uh, future research. So what about irritable bowel syndrome? So there was one study which was published this year. It was randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. So it really everything was done as it, as it should be done. It was in patients with IBS, with diarrhea, or mixed pattern. In this case, the, the, the fecal material was administered during colonoscopy, so basically across the whole large bowel. And there was, again, a significant benefit in this uh, FMT. So, 65% of uh, uh, patients who received FMT improved their symptoms compared to 43% who uh, were treated with placebo. So again, very, very promising. However, there was another study which was presented uh, recently in a, in a big gastroenterology meeting. In that case, the mode of administration was different using the oral capsules. And there was no benefit at the end of the treatment or three or six months after. So maybe not every patient with IBS will benefit from them. The, again, maybe there is, uh, uh, what is important is the, the composition of the fecal microbiota or of the donor. So again, we have to wait for this. So what about probiotics? Again, probiotics, you, if you go to any store, Fortinos or wherever, you, you will find many, many probiotics and you will see also many health claims which are associated with these. Unfortunately, most of these claims are not substantiated by, by science. However, I would like to show you one study which I think was done very well and which shows potential of, of probiotics. And this was study uh, done in, in Netherlands, already published uh, uh, eight years ago. And this was done in healthy volunteers. And the healthy volunteers uh, uh, had actually um, for intervention. So basically every two weeks they came for endoscopy, uh, upper endoscopy. Before that they had to, to drink uh, uh, a probiotic drink uh, which contains either lactobacillus acidophilus, cassei, or rhamnosus, or placebo. And, and uh, they did it for, uh, uh, for four hours. And after these four hours, they had the endoscopy and biopsies were taken. And surprisingly, there were between 500 and 1,000 genes which were affected compared to placebo. Uh, most of them were only mild changes, but some responses were 10 to 20 fold uh, increase. So really significant changes just in the gene expression, which is a really hard outcome uh, uh, for, from this study. What was interesting that although these were all lactobacilli, so, um, and again, I'm going back to what you can find in the stores, there is always lactobacillus, and it tells you how, how good it is. But each of these lactobacilli have actually different effects. Some of them uh, seem to affect immune responses, hormonal signaling. Uh, lactobacillus casei uh, affected Th1 and Th2 balance and ion uh, homeostasis. And lactobacillus rhamnosus was more important for wound healing or angiogenesis. So 
This study shows that the probiotic can work. However, they have differential effects, and we have to keep in mind that what you can find in the stores is um, these are strains which are, uh, in most of them, they are not used in these clinical studies, but they just use association in order to, to have these uh, health claims. Very often, uh, these uh, probiotics are also uh, not active, or the proportion of viable bacteria is much lower than what is, uh, what is on the label. However, there were many studies in uh, irritable bowel syndrome and uh, probiotics, and this is a, a meta-analysis. So that means if you take the results from all individual studies, which are randomized uh, controlled trials, and you compare whether the probiotic improved or uh, uh, was better than, than placebo, uh, you can uh, pool the responses and uh, this most recent uh, meta-analysis, which will be just published within a few weeks, showed that there is a statistically significant benefit of probiotics. However, the problem is that this meta-analysis mixed everything together. So there were some probiotics which uh, contained uh, several bacterial strains. Uh, they were uh, administered with a different regimen, and also the outcomes were different. So overall, it seemed that the probiotic can be beneficial, but we still don't know the, the mechanisms, and probably the, the probiotics will work only in a proportion of, uh, of patients. So can probiotics be used as a treatment for anxiety and depression? I said there were several studies uh, previously in animal models which show that uh, certain probiotics can have beneficial effect, at least in animal models. And one of them is uh, uh, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, which is one of the best studied in, uh, in this field. And there was a, a recent study actually published last year which studied the effect of this uh, probiotic in healthy volunteers. So it was, again, eight-week, randomized, placebo-controlled study. At the end, there was no effect on probiotic treatment on mood, anxiety, stress, uh, HPA axis responses, or, or EEG measures. Similarly, there is a, another probiotic, uh, uh, Lactobacillus helveticus with uh, B. longum. Uh, Again, there were several studies which were done in animal uh, models and also uh, some um, study in healthy volunteers. However, recently there was a, a randomized placebo controlled studies in patients with mild to moderate depression, and unfortunately, no benefit was found uh, uh, in this clinical trial. So I would like to show you, again, trying to convince you that probiotics can be beneficial, and, and actually this was a study using Bifidobacterium longum. This is a uh, strain uh, with uh, which we were working for more than 10 years. And in different animal models, it uh, ameliorated anxiety-like behavior. It also changed uh, BDNF levels in the hippocampus. We studied the, the possible mediator, so we know that it's not uh, immune-mediated. But again, it was uh, dependent on the integrity of the vagus nerve. So in animal models, uh, where we cut the vagus, this uh, probiotic uh, didn't work. And we know that if you just take the, the probiotic or just uh, the, um, uh, the supernatant, so basically taking the metabolites of this probiotic, you can change the activity of sensory nerves in the gut. So there is probably a direct interaction between the, the bacterium and the, and the nervous system. So based on these studies, we have actually uh, designed a, a double-blind, placebo-controlled, uh, uh, randomized controlled trial. These were patients, again, with irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, but they had either mild or moderate anxiety or, or depression. And we were treating them with this uh, probiotic on a daily basis for six weeks, or they were treated with uh, placebo. And then they were studied at six weeks and uh, ten week follow-up. And the primary outcome of this study was actually improvement in either anxiety or depression um, at uh, six weeks. 
And we had multiple uh, secondary outcomes, whether it was improvement in the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, or brain activation patterns using uh, uh, functional MRI, or microbiota profiles. So this is the, the main result from this study. And um, after six weeks, we found that the, in the probiotic uh, arm, 77% uh, of patients improved their depression scores compared to 35% uh, of the placebo group. And again, this 35%, this is basically what you find in, uh, in this type of uh, clinical trials, because patients with functional bowel disorders um, uh, there is a very strong uh, placebo effect. But what's very interesting that uh, this beneficial effect of bacteria was present even one month after finishing the treatment. So uh, something changed uh, in the, the gut-brain signaling and, is, and persisted for, for additional four weeks. Interestingly, we found that the the probiotic also improved changes in symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, but it didn't last. So at one month follow-up, the patient complained about their, their usual uh, gut symptoms. I also mentioned that we, we did uh, uh, the imaging of the brain, and this, was, this is actually functional MRI, which was, uh, which was done here um, in collaboration with our uh, colleagues in, in the neuroscience department, uh, Jeff Hall. And what you are seeing here is actually a, a difference between the two groups. So um, before treatment, there was no difference between the placebo and uh, uh, probiotic arm. So that means all the areas are in gray. We have focused, our primary endpoint was actually activity of the amygdala, and I have already mentioned that brain structure uh, previously when speaking about the, the animal models. And as you can see, there is no different in the, difference in the amygdala activation uh, between these two groups. However, after the treatment, the amygdala was more active in the patients who were treated with placebo. That means that the probiotic-treated patients down-regulated uh, the activity in, in this area. And it was not only uh, there. So again, after treatment, we found there were multiple areas of the brains which were more active in patients with placebo. And these were either the frontal and temporal cortex uh, areas uh, when we compare them to, uh, to patients treated with placebo. Interestingly, these changes in brain uh, activity or the amygdala activation correlated with depression scores. So the patient who improved uh, their depression also uh, uh, showed uh, a decrease in amygdala activation. And in a way, this correlated also with the relief of uh, uh, um, gut symptoms of IBS. So the question again, we have a probiotic which works, but still we don't know what is the, the, the exact pathway. And we again used uh, metabolomics uh, in, uh, on urine and, and uh, serum from these patients. And the urinary metabolites were interesting because uh, there were some um, uh, methylamines and aromatic amino acid metabolites which were altered, and especially this one, which is 4 cresol sulfate. And this is an interesting molecule because uh, when you think about uh, conversion between dopamine and norep norepinephrine, and these are uh, some of the important neurotransmitters in the brain associated with uh, depression, 4 cresol sulfate can actually uh, inhibit uh, the enzyme which is uh, mediating this uh, conversion. So I will be finishing. Uh, so this will be my take-home message. Gut microbiota is an important body organ which shapes host immune system. It affects its metabolism, but it can also affect the distant organs uh, like the brain. The microbiota profiles are probably determined by multiple factors. One of them will be your uh, genetic background. We inherit uh, uh, the microbiota profiles also from, uh, from our moms. But it's probably the long-term diet which will have the decisive role in the, the microbiota profile and uh, activity. With respect to irritable bowel syndrome or, IB or functional bowel disorders, it seems that the clinical data would point towards the 
the role of uh, microbiota in, in IBS, although the, the, the precise mechanisms are not, uh, are not known. From our studies in these notobiotic mouse models, we know that this uh, gut microbiota can change gut function and also affect our, uh, multiple neuroimmune networks, but also host metabolites. And, and I was actually showing you more the kind of the overview data, but I think that each uh, microbiota from each patient which we studied will be slightly different and uh, um, unique with respect to the effect on the host. And then we have the clinical data and animal data which suggest that gut microbiota may be also involved in some psychiatric disorders. And there is also accumulating data showing that this also applies to uh, neurodegenerative disorders, which uh, I was not mentioning today. And finally, uh, it seems that uh, some uh, probiotic bacteria or specific probiotic bacteria can improve depression score, uh, scores and affect brain activity uh, patterns in patients with, uh, with IBS. I would like to point, that, point out that we, we know still uh, relatively little. We have to learn really much uh, more. And, and I think that we will learn at least from the gastrointestinal point of view, uh, a lot from the current study, which, uh, which has been started already two years ago. It's a pan-Canadian study. It's led by McMaster, by uh, Paul Moyeri, where we try to recruit uh, 8,000 individuals, uh, 2,000 patients with Crohn's, 2,000 with ulcerative colitis, and 2,000 with uh, IBS, and compare their microbiota profiles and microbial activity with those of uh, 2,000 healthy volunteers. And although there were similar studies which were performed uh, before, they were all based on low number of, uh, of subjects. And hopefully this uh, big data will give us really a better idea uh, what is the interaction between the microbiome and the host. And, and the important part of this is also that we study the diets and we study the neuropsychiatric uh, um, effects of the microbiota, so the effect of, of anxiety, depression, which are actually very common comorbidities in, in these disorders. So we are, uh, as I say, in two years, so hopefully in five or six years we will have more, more data to share with you. So I would like to acknowledge uh, the, the, the people who were all involved in these studies uh, in our lab, and I would just mention uh, Jada de Palma, who did this uh, notobiotic studies in, in IBS, uh, Ines Pinto Sanchez, who performed the clinical trial in, uh, with uh, Belongum, and Liz Perez, who did studies in the uh, microbiota with uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Thank you very much, and I'm ready to attend questions.